This is the Bad Batch on TV Podcast Industries. We're talking about the Bad Batch 313 into the breach. Even with a stolen shuttle and clearance codes, you can't expect to walk onto an Imperial station completely unnoticed. But you can. And we'll be your security detail. You just walk us right onto the station. You cannot be serious. You were an Imperial before. Impersonating one should be easy enough. I can't wear this. It's a captain's uniform. I was a vice admiral. Well, you've been demoted. <sighs> I hate clones. Welcome back, fellow Batchers, to TV Podcast Industries. We're on to the Bad Batch Season 3, Episode 13, Into the Breach. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow Batchers. I am one of your other hosts, John. And rounding out this trio of Breachers? Bad Batch Breachers? I'm Chris. <laughs> makes it sound as though I'm pregnant. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Ooh, well, look, you are pregnant with the anticipation of the last two episodes of the Bad Batch ever. Mm. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Your banter really needs to be worked out, guys. We, 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 we should think we yeah. should talk about this almost before and not just do it off the cuff. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm, not, I'm not sure whether um, whether live banter works well for you at all. <laughs> it's called vamping, Derek. It's called vamping. Yeah. Move, roll with me. It's the oh. and if. Yes, and. I'll, I'll ask if I need you to vamp, and that's only when I'm trying to look up something on the internet that I can't remember. So, <laughs> Yes, and I will do it with great applause. <laughs> terrible chris no. terrible right maybe i should book you on some courses for some uh, improv um but welcome back fellow batchers to our uh, third last episode of the bad batch ever i don't know yeah. every time i see like a, a tweet from jennifer corbett where she's going oh you're not ready for how it ends and you're going yeah but there's only two more weeks i'm I not ready for oh, just two more weeks of that batch like i am not ready and i am ready if that may in that yeah and this this is a very weird one that I'm not ready because I don't want the journey to end. This episode felt almost like, no, 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 come on, don't end. Just keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It just felt like we were building a bit of momentum at, towards the end of this episode. Yeah. And then literally it's a sharp cut. Absolutely. And yeah. I was like, oh, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. You Like, I, I literally felt, no, this should have, almost this should have ran into the next episode. And then, give oh us yeah, the yeah, you like, absolutely you just... needed um, the next episode after this. Um, it, it, I, I feel like this is an absolutely essential story, and we're going to get into it obviously in, no. in a minute. This is really essential for what's happening in the in the show, of course, absolutely essential. But where it ends feels like this could have been the two part. <laughs> uh, please tell us what's going to happen next. But before we go into the episode discussion, uh, please make sure you subscribe to TV Podcast Industries because if you haven't subscribed to the main feed. That's going to be it for the Bad Batch in two weeks' time. You'll never hear our voices again. Uh, well, you will. You'll, oh, hear no. them, you'll hear them if you subscribe to the Bad Batch podcast, because we will be back with more Star Wars later this year. But we would like you to subscribe to the main feed on TV Podcast Industries, where you'll get access to all the other shows that we're covering, like the epic Shogun, which is coming to its final episode next week. Oh, How's, oh, no. how's that going to end? Bloody? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not even too sure uh, about that. The last couple of weeks have been pretty bloody. Well, that is true. Mm. Yeah. Um. I guess. I'm not well, asking for a prediction uh, for why what exactly is going to happen. <laughs> they'll all put down their weapons and be friends. Could be. Could be. That could Hooray! be the way it'll go. Uh, but if you want to hear our thoughts on Shogun, uh, subscribe to the podcast over there. We do also want to hear your thoughts on the Bad Batch. Again, almost the last opportunity to get your thoughts in. So email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or join us over in our Facebook group where you can chat with us anytime about the Bad Batch over on facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. Give us your final thoughts of the Clone Force 99 from the beginning to now. Have they evolved? Have they changed? Are they the same old guys? Yeah, just let us know. We yeah. want to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. Let's get into our discussion about The Bad Batch 313, Into the Breach. Uh, the executive producer of the show, of course, are Brad Rao and Jennifer Corbett. Uh, this episode was written by Brad Rao, the creator and executive producer for the show, and directed by Saul Ruiz. Uh, of course, the story editor for the series is Matt Miknovitz. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for... Into the breach. Sure. 
Amiga is introduced to her fellow Project Necromancer test subjects, Eva, Jax, Sammy, and Ben. She tells them that she has escaped from Tantis before and plans to do so again, using a passage behind their cell walls. The Bad Batch and Rampart rendezvous with Echo and a stolen Imperial shuttle, which they use to infiltrate an Imperial relay station at Coruscant to find the coordinates for Tantis. Unable to extract the information from the station's databanks, Echo decides to sneak aboard a science shuttle bound for Tantis and disable its proximity sensors. This allows the others to dock on the vessel in their stolen shuttle just as it enters hyperspace. All action. Absolutely. I really love the tension in this episode Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of Clone Force 99 with Rampart in the um, space station. Mm -hmm. That That sounded like something in Cluedo. It Uh was Rampart, (laughs) Clone Force 99 (laughs) in the space station. Um, Exactly. And um, it just loved that. I loved um, the whole tension will... You know, will Echo disable mm-hmm. the proximity sensors? Won't Echo disable the proximity sensors? Mm-hmm. Um, will he will... be left behind? Yeah. Will they be left behind? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, really, stuff. really, really enjoy. Will the somebody? Tension. Will somebody um, put a uh, put a muffler on uh, on Rampart to stop him talking? <laughs> no, not at all. I loved Rampart <laughs> in this episode. Yeah. Um, He's just... massively irritating, but great. Yeah, the most yeah. obnoxious, point, exactly. pompous mm-hmm. Imperial. Ever, absolutely, uh, but really well done, and it was kind of just the flow of put downs from the bad batch. Mm-hmm. Or Rampart was gloriously pompous in, was. in this, um, yeah. and I think also you know the the tension in the vault with Amiga, as absolutely, well. really good. Yeah. So I love that, and there was some great music, great animation as well. Yes, there was. I do want to start there. Um, the music in this episode is fantastic. Done by the Kiners again. Um, there's there's four members of the same family that were, have worked on the music for the specifically for this season of Bad Batch, but they've all been involved in uh, in the Star Wars animated shows for the last couple of years. So um, it, this was so cool. There's a real feeling of John Carpenter's uh, movies from the 80s, the horror movies that he did, his type of music at the opening. It starts the instant the title comes up into the breach, the music changes completely, and we, we get that feeling of just that overwhelming sense of dread uh, from the music. It sets up that moment where we're in with Amiga in the vault. Yeah. No, absolutely. I love that. That introduction Mm. with the music was great. And I think that the shot of Tantis as you mount Tantis is it sort of like this music and then it Mm. goes inside and you're in the the cell part. Just really superbly done. There's another really good one of a complete overhead shot of Tantis or one of the the mountains mm. where you have the inner and outer rings of it with the green and um, and I love that it reflects as well um the overhead shot in the vault of Amiga's plan mm. like the tables and, yeah, and, and cool. the configuration of the vault so yeah. really good yeah really cool yeah really like those those touches in this episode let's get into our blaster point number 1 <laughs> Yes, so Omega meeting her new cellmates. Um, we have the full team here: uh, Eva, Jack, Sammy, and Bairn. I kind of like the little touch that the baby's called Bairn because in Scotland you would call a baby a Bairn. So I would wanted you? to take it in Scottish. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't get that. The wee Bairn over there is. Uh, I always thought it was a river. No, not at all. No, no, no. In Scotland, in Scottish. It's the wee Bairn over there. Look at her crying. Okay. Yeah. There Good you go. To know. I lived in Scotland for a little while. You learn something new. Yeah, I was going to say, literally the star wipe wipe now happens across the screen. The more you know. (laughs) I'm European and I still didn't know that. Wow. You guys need to go to Scotland more. Yeah, I've been to Scotland many times, but maybe just not with any... Bairns, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Look at the wee bird over there. Oh, look at the bird. 
<laughs> not like I go traveling with babies very often, but I, I've certainly heard it. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, fellow Scottish batteries. Uh, if you're out there, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I'm going to show the guys the Wikipedia entry later on after the podcast. <laughs> <finishes showing. laughs> I am right on this, but I thought that's, I thought that was an interesting touch because we didn't get the name of the, uh, of the no. uh, young, uh, new cellmate, uh, for, uh, for, um, the team here, I suppose. The, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we also do get the the name of the the blue mm-hmm. uh, kid as well, yeah. Sammy. So that that was pretty good. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I I kind of enjoyed uh, seeing Amiga sort of settling in, shall we say, mm-hmm. into her new premises in the vault. Yeah. Um, I think what I really liked about it, though, is you immediately see that she's been around the Bad Batch hmm. um, for so long. That kind of training, that military training, uh, the soldier skills, that mm-hmm. kind of thing, put yep. to use. And it kind of, it just took me back to the moment with Ventress, actually, on Pabu, where she says, you know, this isn't military training this is jedi training when amiga was you know complaining about it Mm -hmm. uh, and ventures makes that differentiation there and here it's perfect for you know her training that she has gotten from Mm -hmm. the bad batch is perfect for this situation where she's asking are they always watching Mm -hmm. you know she's looking assessing her escape, really, asking these questions of her four cellmates, yeah. really. And I just thought this was cool, actually. Yeah, yeah. One of, one of the other things I really love about Amiga here is you can see the big sister coming out in her as yeah. well. Um, thought it was really lovely when she's talking to Eva, who's the most talkative of the, of the four characters here. Jack's kind of been uh, a bit beaten down by his experience being put in put away in solitary um you know he's been mm-hmm. been very beaten down by that uh sammy seems really quiet doesn't want to interact just in case she gets punished uh, for it baron obviously can't talk um but eva's been the talkative one she was the one that as we talked about last time we met her that she's got the cutest voice in all of animation <laughs> the minute she talks you go oh very cute but when amiga's talking to her she instantly spots that she has the doll that Amiga made um, when she was there last time that she thought had been destroyed effectively by uh, by Dr. Carr yeah. um, and kind of says to her, I like your doll. Doesn't say, where did you get that? Or that's my doll. I made that. Anything like that. She looks at it going, I like your doll. And then finds out that, that Emery Carr has handed it back to Eva. So that gives Amiga a little bit of information about Emery Carr. While Carr is going along with the plan, she is also treating Eva like she treated Omega as a as a person, as somebody yeah. that should be treated well, not just as a test subject. So I think that gives a little inkling that, again, Emery Carr may come back on side um, towards the end of the season that Omega's now found that out. So maybe it's another inkling. Could you imagine this is the future batch? Maybe. A yeah. ragtag group of potentially force sensitive led by Omega. Like that that's a potential like Could and i was be, kind yeah. of interested to see is do each of them have a more or is each of them kind of have a more a skill mm-hmm. that's they're better at one aspect of being force sensitive one of them is telekinetic a uh, bear they had that amazing push when they were mm-hmm. taken they knocked something over so they're telekinetic could one of the others be x or y and then yeah. from that you get to see Omega kind of building her own version of the bad batch, mm. the bad batch of this case, vault kids. Or, um, yeah, or, or as you I, say, force sensitive kids, because yeah. we, we were talking about it last time that none of these kids know where they're from because when they're delivered to Tantus, they may know the planet, but they're not, they may not be old enough to know where they're from. They may not remember how to yeah, get back yeah. home. So, um, that's more to do with Baron because they were taken from the planet before they could talk so how the hell are you going to be able to find the, their way back and Cad Bane never handed over the information of what planet they were taken from so yeah. um, so the others may be similar though how do you find out how to get back from Tantus to the planet they yeah. were taken from yeah. so they may be like foundlings in the Mandalorian side of the Star Wars universe that these are yeah. kids that have no history and, and can't get back to their history so maybe that's the adventure that goes on after the Bad Batch finishes mm-hmm. yeah yeah like that's if I they like survive it. that's if they survive of course of course I if this gets really dark and emotional, I could see them potentially sacrificing some of the kids. 
Mm-hmm. Maybe. Four, I mean, now this is terrible. I'm yeah. like, well, we've already lost one member of the batch. Yeah. If you really want to break, quote unquote, break like Omega Spirit, what you could see is her losing these kids as they try and escape. Yeah. That could see her going after Hemlock. Like, mm. that could what pushes her to, re- to like, because she's always the one that doesn't want to go, like, she wants to kind of solve things. She, she will yeah. shoot and fight her way, but she's a bit yeah. more, she wants to try and be, but this could see the darkening of her. Maybe. Two episodes left, though, Chris. Two episodes left. That's a lot left. to do, but yeah. that's what, that's, the, is, in, yeah. that's the instantaneous push. Mm. When you kill kids, that's where yeah. you go, oh, go, but see, go I, me. I see. Instantly, as you were talking about in Star Wars history, all I was thinking of in my head was the dead Ewok in Return of the Jedi when I was like eight yeah. years old watching that. And that's the thing that I came out of the cinema going, they killed the teddy bear. <laughs> like, yeah. You're right. It, is, it gives a massive reaction to a, to a war. If you I find that a really good, like emotional moment yeah. in Return of the Jedi, yeah. because you've got the other one getting up and seeing if yep. uh, his, his dead mate is okay. But alas, you know, yeah. Not exactly. going to get stuffed, I guess. Before Think about the death the of all the children in uh, Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> Absolutely, the death yeah, of all the younglings, exactly. yeah, younglings. or the murder yeah, of all the younglings, yeah. Where yeah. literally you see Anakin go in, and like we then oh. saw it in the Mandalorian. Yeah, exactly. From a different angle, so yeah. it can that go there. sticks, and it will. I can see Star Wars doing that because they're like, there's precedent. Yeah, I know this is also a kids show, but. I, I just can't see them doing it in the next two episodes. If it was the hinge point of the season going into the last half of the season, I could oh, see yeah, them maybe doing it. But, but if they were to end the season with two episodes left to go, killing a few kids and, and trying to push Omega into a new, uh, I don't know, a new fight. Um, I, I don't know. Unless we know something's coming afterwards for Omega and they have it confirmed where they know she's going to go in the future, maybe. But I can't see it happening in the next couple of episodes. No, but I mean, the thing that is echoing in the back of my mind mm. is exactly what you said about the, the showrunner saying he won't believe how this ends. Well, and so if this is setting up the reason for the Emperor's return, that ultimately happens. So yep. some of this project carries on. Or it is saved. So it might ultimately be that Tantus is destroyed or whatever. Yeah. Um, but that... I think this is how the project is put on ice for a while. Yeah. Is what this is. Because the Emperor is alive right now. <laughs> he's, he's dealing with Darth Vader right now. No, so, I agree. Uh, he doesn't need this technology for about 30 more years. So why is a technology that's getting really close to perfection right now why does it take another 30 years to to work so well, i think the battle versus tantus in the last in the last couple of episodes is what puts it on ice for a while i think that's yeah. why that's my theory let's wait and see yeah exactly uh, in amongst this these meetings with uh with amiga and her uh, and her current cellmates or her new cellmates um, we also see a little moment where then we car i just wanted to come back to it because i mentioned about uh, about Car being uh, nice to Eva and Omega finding out about that, we do see Car looking on with another one of the scientists, and she's challenged by that scientist for putting Omega into the same room as the other uh, the other cellmates because yes, Doctor Scalder, Doctor Scalder, there you go. Uh, they're all test subjects, whereas Omega is possibly the key. So what we've been speculating, what we were talking about, was they mix the blood of these test subjects who are who have uh, got the high M counts with Omega's blood, but putting the two sets of the experiment together in the same room is considered a bad idea by Dr. Scalder here. And she challenges Emery Carr, but the pushback is, well, I'm now the lead scientist here, so my decisions are the decisions that should be made. So yeah. um, I just thought it was, again, a bit, a bit interesting that there's some challenge coming up there between the scientists on the project. Well, I'm guessing that Dr. Scalder will feature when... Um, Amiga's escape plan uh, ultimately comes to fruition in some way. Whether it's that she raises the alarm, she's mm-hmm. the one that's had the suspicion. This is the one that could, you know, be the competitive edge to push Emery Carr aside and to become the chief scientist because yeah, she warned her about it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm guessing promotion in um, the Imperial Scientific Corps is just like in the Imperial Navy, where it's like we well, try and undermine the person who's uh-huh. currently your boss so that you're proven to be more loyal, better, yeah. or whatever. Or it's just as easy as every car's was, which was 
look, I've worked here for ages. Can I not just have the lead scientist role on this project? Yeah, okay, we'll give you a go. But yeah, good to highlight it. I think we might see Dr. Scalder back uh, in the future, as you say. Uh, let's move on to blaster point number two. <laughs> Sticking with Amiga and, and partly what you you, were, you guys were saying, um, she's coming up with a plan from the minute she gets in there. That's our Amiga. She's not willing to lie down. And I think what drives that mostly, as she says to the rest of her cellmates, is, well, I've been here before. It might look scary. It might look difficult. But I was able to get out. So it's doable. Yeah. So, yeah, I've escaped before. I'll do yeah, it again. Do it again. Yeah. And I'll take you with uh, yeah. me. You know, it is the rally cry to the Rugrats. Absolutely. Here, yeah. Um, which I quite liked, actually. Amiga's really good here. Like you say, the, the whole big sister side of things, mm-hmm. but also I just love how, you know, she's absorbed like a sponge everything that the Bad Batch has sort of taught her yeah. uh, over these, you know, last two and uh, a half seasons. And, uh, you know, it's sort of being put to really good use mm-hmm. on her own independently. Yeah. Um, you know, and even just being sneaky about it in terms of taking the piece of equipment off dr carl's kind of tray when she's coming in taking mm-hmm. the the blood sample um uh as well as you know just sort of as i say rallying the troops the yeah. other rugrats there in the vault absolutely first i found this so interesting because mm. what i see here is they're building omega to be this highly capable character who yeah. has the skill sets and training from the Bad Batch, some of the biggest Clone Force 99, one of the biggest kind of guerrilla warfare style and kind of units in the world mm-hmm. or in the galaxy far, far away. And a, a, a potentially like some connection to the force, whether she just has a high M count, which, or she can contain an M count. Like there's an opportunity to build something there. Like, I think she will continue on. I think mm-hmm. they, they're they showing that... She, and I say this now, they probably kill her off in the last episode. But I, don't think <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think but so. I think they're building Omega to be that character who could move forward, who yeah. could step out of Batch, Bad Batch and become the, the Boba Fett yeah. um, kind of thing, which was Boba Fett literally stepped out into the comic books and became his own thing. Like... To the he even got his own show. Like yeah. I could see her getting maybe her own show yeah. because she is me at animated. Or do you know what you do? You do a live action. Yep. And it's a, a six episode mini where it's her learning more. It's her growing up twenty years in the future towards <laughs> just after, um, uh, just after the Empire. Or much like what we saw from the Rebels in Ahsoka. I I could see Omega, an older version of Omega, turning up in Ahsoka. Yeah, Um, yeah, absolutely. Like one of the things we've commented on a few times as um, Ahsoka's been sitting back and watching the Batch members and picking up some of their traits. We we saw her specifically watch Hunter and learn some of his traits when she spent more time across her. You see her sitting back and kind of, you know, take just little things like the toothpick that Crosshair always yeah. uh, always bites on. You see her biting on a toothpick while she's sitting beside Crosshair. So she's absorbing all of their traits. And if there's anyone in danger in the show, I don't think it's Amiga. I don't think she's the one that's going to die. I think it is the end of the Bad Batch themselves, the rest of the team. And she comes out of it. And what we have in the future is Omega as a character calling back to things that we know from these characters, traits that Echo has, traits that Tech had, traits that Wrecker had and Hunter had that are now feeding through Omega and what you're, what you're seeing here while she's making this escape plan, as you said, John, is using those tricks, using that, that knowledge and becoming her own person and being really capable. And I will say, I was absolutely having flashbacks to the uh, the Andor series and Cassian Andor trying to escape from his prison, being there all on, all on his own and making a plan with the rest of the inmates there to escape from the prison. So it, I could see that yeah. reflecting here in, in Omega's escape plan. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah, definitely. But please stop saying that the Bad Batch is going to die. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Otherwise, Omega might not be the hero. She might retire to the Outer Rim with PTSD or something like that. Yeah. Or just go into hiding, do an Obi-Wan Kenobi. Exactly, yeah. You know? Yeah. 
And then come out when the time is right, like yeah. Ahsoka live action. They all go back to Pabu. Pabu was not destroyed like we thought it was going to. They all go back to Pabu and hide out together. I for really a hope of years. we see Pabu in live action as well. Oh, I like that. Would that would be beautiful to see it in would, live action. Yeah. It would. Like yeah. just would. the island town. Yeah. yeah be, definitely. You could literally film in Hawaii and it would just, well, you don't even need your volume. You can just film on the volume now, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, the romance, the beauty of real mm-hmm. real life location shooting destroyed in an instant. But it would look, look fab in the volume. Andor <laughs> wasn't filmed in the volume. It was all done in practical locations, so they don't have to use it just because Star Wars shows use it. So it's okay. We do still have some romance left that can be done. All we need is James, Cam- James Cameron to come in and uh, use his avatar skills uh, oh. to build, to build uh, Pabu. That'd Stop. be cool. No. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, that'd yeah. be fine. Anything else about Amiga's no. uh, Amiga's escape plan, guys? Um, no, no. Again, I like how the tension ratcheted up there with Doctor Scolder. You know, where where Amiga's trying to find the escape point in, in the wall and, mm-hmm. and to find that kind of ducting uh, void where all the blood samples are taken. Yeah. So I, I kind of like that and how you know Doctor Scolder's coming down. You know, she's kind of not happy with Emery Carr having basically, you know, taken her, the job she thought was rightfully hers. Yeah. Um, and again, having Amiga luckily, uh, having it all put back together just in time, mm-hmm. but then coming out to inform, um, the, the other cellmates that I found our way out, mm-hmm. you know, I, but I kind of like that. I just, you know, is she going to get found out? Is she not? Um, yeah. Or, you know, would she tackle Dr. Scalder? You yeah. know, but because it's in the cell, she's not seen. So then she can, or something, you know, given there's only two episodes left, I, you know, I thought maybe something else would kind of possibly happen. And mm. um, I felt it was a very contained story. Mm-hmm. Um, but that weirdly, I liked it the more I watched it. Right. So yeah. certainly the second time of of watching it, I found it a, a much better uh, episode. Mm-hmm. But I, I think it's because it's just purely built on the tension, raising the tension yeah. Yeah. Of, of this um, ultimate escape or failure, um, mm-hmm. however it may play out. Uh, and it is really good. Yeah. I just can't, I hope, I hope it's not going to end with like the Bad Batch's ship crashes on the planet before it gets to Tantus and then it just cuts to Omega in her cell and fade to black. End of <laughs> series. That would be awful. Would yeah. Be awful, that would John. be awful. So hopefully it's a, a big success at the end of the season. Yeah. Well, I hope so. With fireworks and I parasols. really hope the Bad Batch survive. Right. And they find tech alive and well in Tantus, right. not having been horrendously disfigured from Hemlock's uh, experiment. <laughs> let's hope not. Let's hope yeah. not. Um, let's move on to the rest of the Bad Batch then for our blaster point number three. The rest of the episode really is the Bad Batch and Rampart. And I think actually we could probably do about 15 points about this section of the episode because there was so much good stuff in here. Um, we mentioned Rampart earlier on. He is such a brat and such, <laughs> such an annoyance uh, on the Bad Batch, but so pompous, <laughs> so arrogant. But they yeah. play it so well from that opening moment um, on what looks like Cloud City or another Cloud City in the galaxy. It does look a little like that, doesn't yeah. it? Um, it looks before, kind of a bit desolate. Um, like maybe before Lando took it over and turned it into yeah, the party haven. Uh, that I'm sure he undoubtedly did. But uh, maybe, maybe before he took it over and cleaned it up, let's say. Yeah. Um, or it's another cloud city that's uh, fallen into slight disrepair, maybe. Or, I mean, Lando always said it was a mining operation. Mm-hmm. So it kind of did have that mining operation feel, at least... You couldn't really see much of it in close up other than kind of it did seem a bit of a, a desolate abandoned. Mm-hmm. It almost looked rusted. But then you could imagine that a mining operation, you know, it's not really thinking about aesthetics. Yeah. Absolutely. Because Lando does. Yeah. You can comes see, you in can all, like, yeah. I need a cape. Absolutely. Where's my cape room? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You can all need shiny cloud city yeah. type things. But you can also see that somebody might lose that in a gambling, uh, in, in a bet. Yeah, uh, exactly. Gambling where they're kind of going, yeah, it's, it's a it's a cloud city that I'm, that I'm putting <laughs> up, but it's not really worth that much. But uh, he came in and cleaned it up maybe. 
Not really a correction, but I've just seen the uh, StarWars.com uh, official episode guide for this episode uh, after we've recorded the podcast and uh, just found out that the base here is actually a former Kaminoan facility. It's Bora Vio, uh, which we saw back in Season 1, Episode 9. So not Cloud City at all. I hope you don't mind the banter. Uh, But yeah, uh, that's an an interesting location to go back to. That's where we had um, Cad Bane going after Omega back in in the first season of uh, of The Bad Batch. So um, that's quite an interesting callback that we just didn't catch uh, when we were watching the episodes. But back to the rest of the thoughts on episode 13 of season three. We do have the, the first instance when the Batch are with, uh, with Rampart waiting for the arrival of Echo. uh, And just some fun little moments there with, uh, with, with them where, they're still completely not trusting Rampart that his information is going to be valid. Uh, you got was, excited, didn't you? Thought that was really good. No, uh, you thought Nick Fury was going to come in here because Echo referred to Rampart as Hydra Snake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, I did. I, Are you sure? Because I kind of no. <laughs> <laughs> It's like crossover. Hey! <laughs> yeah, well, that was it. Echo saying, "Can we trust that Hydra snake?" Um, and just rampart from behind. You know, classic gag. Mm-hmm. I can hear you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm here. I can hear you. I, I, I always think that's fun yeah. because th- those moments happen in live action and in an animation where two characters have a discussion that the other, ca- that the third character they're talking about absolutely can hear. There's no way that they, that everything went uh, so loud around them or so quiet around them that nobody else could hear the conversation. So I always like that little gag of. I'm right here. I can hear you. Uh, so I thought that was really good. And that's yeah. the thing. He is a ball and chain around their ankles. You know, their collective mm-hmm. ankles is Rampart. But at the same time, he's also in and of this moment very valuable because he has the only information that could possibly lead them to Tantus, yeah. even though it's not totally complete. I mean, he, he kind of goes, well, I don't know the technical details yeah. of all of this. But this well, is how it happens. You know, this yeah. is how it sort of generally high level happens yeah. so that's what i loved i love that because yeah your boss's boss's boss doesn't <laughs> exactly. know like how to code uh-huh. they know like if we go to this place they, we go there there he doesn't understand the details and i was like yeah that is the most it is the, so the most realistic yeah. part of Star Wars ever. Absolutely. It's just like I don't know the details. Absolutely. Like, yeah, perfect. Yeah. And it is given absolute life that, isn't it, by the fact that they hand over an imperial uniform for him to wear uh-huh. on station three uh-huh. that's over Coruscant and he says, Well, I can't wear this. And you're like well, is that because, you know, maybe he's put on a, or lost a fair bit of weight in mm. prison? Um, he says, I can't wear this. This is a captain's uniform. Right, I was a vice admiral. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so deliciously pompous. Yeah. It's just so, so good. It's yeah. really, really good. Isn't it? It's like as if he thinks because he was a vice admiral in that position that every single member of the empire would recognize him now and would know that he's wearing the wrong uniform because yeah, exactly. everybody knows me rampart and know? i don't want to make it all blaze runnery by mm. sort of referring back to andor on it but it's where that voiceover of cassian andor saying you know the imperials they're so comfortable and fat that they don't even know or see you mm-hmm. so that you can get in even into their own house yes. or however he says it, because it is exactly that kind of attitude mm-hmm. from yeah. Rampart that Andor is talking about here. Yeah. He's so full of himself in a pompous way, Absolutely. bombastic way that it's just, yeah, you could pinch anything from underneath him because, of, well, I don't need to worry about the technical details. Absolutely. That, that's <laughs> for my love. underlings to worry yeah. about. Yeah. But that, but also part of that pompousness is what does save them throughout some of the parts in the mission. Like Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Him browbeating a lieutenant down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they don't have clearance, they're not there, blah, blah. Just, it, it, yeah. it's the, the, it's the true, like, it's, yeah, it's Rampart. It's just like, he it just is. talked yeah. his way, it, and I was like, I actually like this. The worst part is I like this character. Yeah, just, yeah I know. Like it's so fantastic. You like to hate. Mm-hmm. Well, after he's done that, he goes, oh, I've missed this. Uh-huh. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, yeah. you could just imagine him in prison or having to deal with, you know, the other prisoners, and I'm like, 
I can't say anything to them, and they certainly <laughs> won't follow anything I say. Yeah, um, and- we saw a little bit of that, obviously, with the uh, with the on the prison planet, where the only person that works with them doesn't understand his language. So yeah. it's the frustration of him is more probably born from I can't even order this guy around because he doesn't understand my language. You know, <laughs> but, um, but that's yeah. it. But it, and it even follows on. So I think Hunter says something to him like, "Do your thing," and Rampart corrects Hunter and says. Do your thing, sir. Because uh-huh. <laughs> he's like in character. Um, and Hunter's like, I don't think so. It uh-huh. just like cuts him off. And that's the other thing. Just how the Bad Batch reacted to him yeah. as well. It's like, yeah. I mean, even with the, the captain's uniform, they say, well, you had a demote, you're being demoted. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just yeah. so, it's so good. I loved all this back and forth between them. Yeah. But again, it's like you say, Chris, like he, He's got a really important thing here. And actually, in some respects, you know, one of the great things that makes this so tense is purely the fact that they're so deep into Imperial territory. Absolutely. Like, they're above the capital planet yeah. of the galaxy. Where everything like, went down. Uh, if a something of, goes wrong, a before, there's yeah. a lot of naval ships, mm-hmm. of stormtroopers that can get them you know yeah. this is deep into the heart of enemy territory so it makes beast, it really really, yeah. really tense mm-hmm. and you know in a sense rampart understands that and yep. i like the fact that through this as well i mean certainly towards the end as they're about to attach onto the science vessel mm. you know he's like saying no, we've got to abort this mission. Uh-huh. Now, part of it is probably to save his own skin, but yeah. in a sense, it is almost a bit like whether it's the angel or the devil on the shoulder of Hunter, it's one of those two mm. telling the opposite of what Hunter is thinking. So I kind of quite enjoyed that as yeah. well. Yeah. Even though Rampart's probably doing it purely for selfish purposes, it... it I'd say self-preservation to give him a little bit of... Yeah, a little well, that's bit of, what I mean. Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, he says, I didn't sign up for this exactly. part of it. Exactly, You know, uh, let me go, effectively. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. there's a bit it was, of... And that. it wasn't the deal. The deal was to lead them to their way to Tantus, and then they'll drop them off somewhere. But it turns out that uh, their way to Tantus had to be taken immediately. And they're, they really do struggle <laughs> with this as well. You know, the, the separation of the group where they have to let Echo get aboard the ship and crack the codes so that they can get through to Tantus. You know, that's also its own tension because um, the countdown's going. And if they oh. get found out, they will uh, they will be killed, you know? That last 30 seconds of this show, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. this episode, was just fantastic. And the, Absolutely. The, for, like, honestly, and I'm kind of giving away my, my opinion now, like, for me, that saved this episode in that, the rest of it was fun, and it was a good, it was a good episode. Mm-hmm. That last thirty seconds made me go, "Oh, you're a great episode." Yeah, because yeah. that's what you were building to, mm-hmm. and then just you're ratcheting the tension slightly with a bit of humor here and a bit of this. this you're just kind of, it's basically like adding truffle right at the end, sprinkling <laughs> some tru- yeah. shaved truffle mm. over your pasta, and you're just like, "Okay, that's what just brings it to life." Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even that, that, I love the stealth moves of Echo to get on board. Yes. Like, where the mm-hmm. fact that one of the, the stormtroopers from Tantis, the one with the blue kind of visor eyes, and mm-hmm. um, Scorcher, sc- right? yeah. yeah, I guess, I guess so. And um, obviously has spotted something out of the corner of their eye mm-hmm. uh, as the droids are moving cargo back and forth and he goes to investigate but i love like echo just slipping down from the the, the cargo conveyor that Absolutely. the droid was driving and um, just sneaking through to get on board via the r2d2 uh droids mm-hmm. uh army shoot i guess <laughs> like um, the whole droid army of yeah. r2d2 or, or two units i guess yeah i'm surprised they didn't start screeching Gosh. um to say that there was an unauthorized officer but they were in their clone trooper uniforms so i guess yeah. it wasn't that out of place even though he was being a bit sneaky absolutely you know that is something that we should point out as well um part of the plan here is that they have to take off they have to scrape down their um the uniforms that they've 
personalized effectively yeah. for the last two seasons, making them really personal to each of the members of the Bad Batch. They're now all scraped all the way down back to standard clone trooper outfits or yep. similar to uh, maybe ones that have seen some heavy action, but they're pretty close to back to scratch, right? Yeah. So all that personalization is all gone now. Yeah, but like, look, Wrecker was the worst. Well, worst. Wrecker was the biggest offender, I should say. <laughs> His armor was probably some of the most um, recognizable based on it. It's kind of customization, in my opinion. Yeah. I.e. things. Yeah. I think, I think but- all of them had good customization to reflect their individual character as well. And most of, most of the clones that worked with, uh, worked with Ahsoka over the years as well would have had their own personalization on their, on their outfits and just tearing that back to make them look like, other clones it's just it's just a big moment i think is all yeah for me it's it's these little bits that are the ones that are kind of like building towards this finale Mm. it's like they're taking away things they're stripping away things yeah to build it back up i'm assuming hopefully no it's hopefully that's the kind of thing it's just like Mm. okay you're taking away what it makes the batch the batch Mm -hmm. in certain ways very much in my opinion it's coming down to self-sacrifice Mm. The team is self-sacrificing for Omega yeah. because they are self-sacrificing for the fifth member of, well, you know, the proxy fifth. Mm. Uh, she was the sixth, now she's the fifth yeah. uh, member of the, the batch. And I think that's the important thing, which is they are sacrificing everything. Some of the things that make them unique. Exactly. Uh, well, that's it. Because, I mean, you know, at that moment where, you know, they realized that they can't just hack the the navi computer aboard the station and get those coordinates mm-hmm. but that the coordinates because of the secrecy of this base actually get uplinked to the science vessel or any vessel that's departing for tantis mm-hmm. uh, once it's uh, left the space dock mm-hmm. and then obviously they they have to sort of go on the fly and they get echo to board that vessel mm-hmm. so they can somehow attach themselves to it by re- getting rid of or disabling the proxy sensors but you know it's like it is on the hoof now and that's where yeah. you get rampart you know being totally unconvinced that this is the plan that he signed up to Mm -hmm. and he says you know we're all going to die whether that is um a a foreboding Mm. um of what is to come on tantus for the bad batch uh, and maybe even rampart who knows but you know this is as you say that's the self-sacrifice here that's Mm -hmm. the the plan hasn't worked but now it's a game of chance and that's what exactly. makes that ending as you say chris so so yeah. great yeah. It, and it's also the cuts of going from the you know the the command part of the science vessel all that going on mm. you know the order to jump with echo in the cargo hold with hunter effectively you know just sort of twitching his fingers mm. feeling the getting the feel of the dice really that kind of sense to of when to go and rampart effectively objecting to everything that's going on and in the end just go for it whether proximity sensors are disabled or not but it's also again speaks to the trust of the brotherhood with that will echo will get this done and that's what he's yeah that's what tips the balance of probability for him i love that absolutely absolutely Really good and great, a great ending, a nice little mm. cliffhanger for it. But you're totally right, Chris. If this was, if the whole series was out, I absolutely would be watching the next episode immediately afterwards. Yeah. So, so I'm very much looking forward to next week's episode. Uh, any final notes? Any other thoughts that we have before we close out the episode of the Bad Batch? The only two things are I mentioned about sort of some of the animation of Tantis that mm-hmm. I really liked. Equally, I loved it when they arrived to Coruscant, and you have. Um, the space station number mm-hmm. three over Coruscant. Mm-hmm. But there's also, as Hunter's piloting that shuttle out of the the station, mm-hmm. um, I just think there's a great scene of the shuttle swooping around the station towards the science vessel and also then of that tilt happening in the cockpit of 
uh, that shuttle with yeah. Hunter. Very it cool. looked really, really good. Mm-hmm. You know, we've always said there's just moments of animation um, punctuated through this Bad Batch that are just so cinematic. I mean, it looked fantastic. Mm. Oh, it absolutely did. They're just, they're, they're just nailing it with this season. And uh, with all seasons of the Bad Batch, actually been really, really good to watch. So excellent stuff. Uh, so overall, Chris, what did you think of the Bad Batch season three, episode 13, Into the Breach? So I kind of talked about this earlier. Uh, initially, for me, this was a good episode. Like, it had Rampart brought the humor along with some of the record and kind of uh, crosshair quotes in there. Mm-hmm. So it was good. That last 30 seconds of the tension that ratcheted up of like, I thought they were going for a split second not attach. And yep. we were going to get very similar to Crosshair's kind of um tracker. Just kind of going. Yeah. Exactly. I yeah. thought we had that. So it built the tension so well. Mm-hmm. I was like, no, this is a great episode. This, you were given a task, mm-hmm. you delivered, and then some. So I'm like, yeah, I can't fault it. Next. What the only thing, and this is not their fault, I wanted the next episode. Because yeah. I'm yeah. like, it felt so short because uh-huh. it was a very, it was basically a two story episode. Mm-hmm. Like you, you had the Omega bit and then you had the, ba- the batch team. That was it. So I was like, oh, no, 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 give me this now. To know that we have two weeks. Yeah. That is the hard part. Mm. I'm like, next week will also only be a very short episode, probably. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll get the big finale. Mm. So I'm like, yeah, like if you, you do two fades to blacks back to back, ooh, that's going <laughs> to it's gonna break my heart. That's going to break my heart, guys. Yeah. Um, but absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Johnners. Uh, what are your final thoughts of this episode? Yeah, I absolutely loved uh, this episode mm-hmm. of The Bad Batch, Into the Breach. I'd give it four and a half raging ramparts out of five. <laughs> um, I just loved how the tension was built um, on Tantis with Amiga and, you know, her scoping out the um her her potential escape mm-hmm. and on board station three but in particular those final moments as to whether they're able to lock on to the ship before it jumps uh, yeah. in hyperspace uh, and whether those proximity sensors uh were disabled or not um so really enjoyed that like him or loathe him I think Rampart is, and along with the Bad Batch and how they play off one another, absolutely fantastic in this episode. I never thought (laughs) this character could be integrated in this way Mm -hmm. from certainly season two and everything happening on Camino. Uh, But, you know, he is the reluctant participant, but ultimately he doesn't wrap them out. Um, Exactly. You know? And yeah. now that's because he's also a fugitive on the run. He's effectively joined them. But I, yeah. I love this dynamic, uh, through, um, this episode with the seriousness of what they were, um, looking and trying to do. And uh-huh. um, so I absolutely really, really enjoyed this episode. Four and a half raging ramparts out of five. Great stuff. And, it, and it's, it's really interesting. You know, we haven't had that moment from Rampart like we had with Crosshair where he realizes the Empire had turned on him completely and he's now back on the right side. He's back with the Bad Batch. We didn't get that from Rampart. But it's interesting. It's only after we recorded last week that I was going back through um, just Rampart's story effectively. And he's the fall guy for what happened on um, Camino. That's what happened to him. They basically, they, stripped everything from him and sent him off to a pen- penal colony after destroying Camino. It wasn't his fault. He wasn't responsible for it, but that's what's happened. He's yeah. had the entire empire turn on him and send him away. And as you say, even in, in, in this stage, he's still going, Ooh, I've missed the power that I had when yeah, I was yeah. in the leadership of the empire and not I'm, I'm against them now. I'm joining you. I've become a good guy, you know? So uh, that's really interesting for the character that he's still the pompous buffoon that he was, but really, <laughs> fun to watch absolutely so. and yeah. again i liked amiga in this episode just in terms of how all that information the observation the training from the bad batch mm-hmm. you know the training the osmosis whatever it is yeah. just being put to use now that she's back at mount tantus in the vault and you know 
she's stepping up there. So, yeah, yeah absolutely loved exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. Well, we need to go and have a drink. We need to go to the cantina, John. We certainly do. Fellow quizzers, fellow batchers, welcome to the Bad Batch Cantina Quiz. It is a two-parter. Mm. Strap yourselves in. Make sure those proximity sensors are disabled. Uh, drink is in hand and get ready to clamp on to two questions for episode 13 of The Bad Batch. Question 13. What is the class of shuttle stolen by Echo and used by the Bad Batch? And what is the landing bay designation for the shuttle at Station 003? Ooh, very good. Very good. Both of those, of course, in this episode. There's been one question for every episode uh, of the Bad Batch so far this season. So I hope you're gathering together all your answers um, to send them in at the end of the season to get your hands on the Bad Batch Funko Pops that we have yes. available to send out. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, that's the 13th question, as I say, of 15. So not very long to go on the pub quiz either. John, do you want to give the question one more time? What is the class of shuttle stolen by Echo and used by the Bad Batch? And what is the landing bay designation for the shuttle at Station 003? Fantastic. If you've missed any of the questions from the season, pop on over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com. There is a pub quizzes section up there that has each of the questions uh, available there. So you can gather them all together just in case you missed one. Or, hey, why not go back and listen to every episode of the Bad Batch coverage for season three? Absolutely. Get those answers in, fellow quizzes and batches. I think it's time for some feedback. Absolutely. First up, Joe Herbers over on Facebook says, why didn't Amiga do her exploring at night? I don't think she knows it's at night because it's the vault. <laughs> that's a that's a pretty good answer. I I think it's more um she's not willing to wait. She's really eager. I think her escape might be at night when there's a big long period between visits or yeah. nobody's testing on them because they say they test after meals, so that's during daytime. So I think she's just not willing to wait. She's too eager. She knows she can escape from this place. She just needs to find the way. So she's taking an opportunity and then nighttime comes and maybe she'll escape then. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. I, I just have the feeling that the Empire floods that with light all, all the day. time. Yes, yes. Uh, the answer I'm going to give is if it was completely dark, uh, we wouldn't see anything in the animation. So it would make true. a really boring <laughs> episode part. That's true. So she turns on the just, lights. Everybody is aware of her escape. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So she's got, oh, like, literally dear. you'd have a few minutes of just like noise and just complete pitch black on the oh. screen. Probably not great to look at. I mean, I guess as well, Joe, I guess the the Empire's always got its beady little eyes on them. Well, so, yeah. I mean, the interesting thing is that the cells potentially don't have some kind of sensor or, I guess, video camera. Well, they've got a big... Uh, like ring. They've not got, like, <laughs> ring. But they've got a massive um, laser door on the front of them, and there's no escape from the inside, John. <gasps> But what if there is? The, well, exactly. That's what Amiga's found, exactly. you know? She's yeah. found the porthole in the uh, in the Death Star uh, to blow the entire thing up. She's found <laughs> the little weakness in Tantus. It's always a weakness. We know that. The yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, That's yeah. what happens when you force people to build <laughs> these stations for you. Um, you know, <laughs> like Jyn Erso's father, uh, who created the weakness in the Death Star, right? Um, yeah, you know, that's if true. If you force people to do it, they will create weaknesses that can be exploited by people like Omega. Yes, so, exactly. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we've solved it, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Next up, we have some feedback from Lindsay Lowers, who had this to say. Hello, fellow batchers, and a special hello to my favourite batcher, Echo. Welcome back. This episode had so many parallels to Andor of all things. It just so happens both are my favourite. The Bad Batch for animation, Andor for live action. From Omega figuring out an escape and learning about her prison, similar to Cassian in Narkina 5, to the Bad Batch having faith for Echo to pull off his part, mm -hmm. reminding me of the old Hanny heist. Mm, yes, very good. This episode was deliciously tense. The only negative thing I have to say about it is... Man, it ended too soon. Props to Rampart for keeping his side of the bargain, but who knows how he'll be like once they get back to Tantus. Mm. Absolutely cheering, rooting for all the heroes to succeed, but the dread that the show has built up is hard to shake as well. Thanks for letting me ramble, and very eager to hear everyone else's thoughts, as always. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, 
I agree with you. The props to Rampart, like that we talked about, he's a mm-hmm. fantastic addition to this show, and I like yeah. I loved most of what he was in. That being said, yeah, they're taking him to Tantus. Mm-hmm. He could literally turn around and go over here and that kind of <laughs> thing and you're like yeah. oh okay that's how it goes bad <laughs> you stay on the ship i hope you don't get eaten by the native wildlife uh, on yes. Kansas. because <laughs> yeah he doesn't have much skills when he's on a place where he's been before and he can't do a covert op with them this time right so, absolutely uh, yeah yeah and Lindsay, yes, I absolutely loved uh, your use of deliciously here mm. in in this uh, like myself um too many people use it, I guess, as an adjective. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but I also, like you say, it was deliciously tense. Mm-hmm. And I think as well, what you hit upon as well is, and it's probably mainly through Tantis and Hemlock, but the dread, like you say, that has been built up over this uh, season is mm-hmm. difficult to shake. Um, and yeah. you do worry that they are flying or hyperspacing it into the jaws of the monster mm-hmm. uh, rather than this being uh, particularly uh, sort of going to be a happy ending for some reason, yeah. or at least not for all of them. I mean, if only they could hyper space them through the back of the monster's mouth and then through its brain and then <laughs> it, they would live. Well, yeah. I, I suppose that's the kind of thing with the Bad Batch this season. You know, it's been um, that level of dread has been on us since we lost Tech, right? Yeah. Um, last season, that's kind of you know, what's going to happen. Who's going to go next? Or are they going to be able to get out of this situation? Yeah. And part of the problem here with Tantus was they couldn't get Omega back from Tantus at the beginning. Omega and Crosshair escaped together. They, they had to meet up because they didn't know the location. But they also don't seem to have a plan for what happens when they get to Tantus. And it's a massive facility and there's only five of them, right? So yeah. how are they breaking into Tantus to get her out? It's kind of get us there, get us on the planet. We'll work our way out when we get there. Omega on the inside trying to work her way out. And they do have potentially um, from Crosshair getting out, there is potentially a way in, but have have the Empire sealed that from the last time they escaped. So, But yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what plan they come up with when they arrive at the impenetrable fortress <laughs> that is Tantus that a little girl uh, escaped from. (laughs) (laughs) You know, as I say, uh, these things are designed by people who don't like the Empire, it seems. (laughs) Exactly. Brilliant stuff, Lindsay. Uh, As you say, yeah, really had those flashes to uh, to Andor as well. Um, Those great scenes in Andor. So uh, it's it's funny, isn't it? We made a casual comment that this this show right at the beginning of uh, this season that it's going to be the Andor for kids. And it seems like it's turning out that way as the season goes on um, with all the amount of time spent in prisons and breakouts. (laughs) Uh, Brilliant stuff. But thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay. And our last bit of feedback comes in from Dr. Bob Phillips, who says, It's good to know if you say it with enough condescending ire in a posh English accent that all security procedures or of even hyperstellar armies will crumble and rebel fighters can do their best. Really enjoying the great escape plan with dominoes and a knitting needle, and it was very generous of Amiga not to reclaim the straw doll. More hints here that Emery might crack under the pressure of sheer cuteness, but I don't think she'll get out herself. Interesting, Dr. Bob. Yeah, it seems, seems like you're aligned with the idea that we could have Emery on the right side, uh, aligning with the Bad Batch, but mm, maybe she's the one that could be gone before the end of the season. Great stuff. Thanks, Dr. Bob. And thanks, everyone, for your feedback. If you want to send us feedback, you can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or pop on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. Uh, just a reminder, in case you're trying to find any of our old episodes, Google Podcasts has shut down, so all of our podcasts are now available over on YouTube. Uh, it's a little bit weirder uh, over there, but um, but you can still listen to the podcasts. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I find it, I find it weird putting uh, podcasts uh, and audio medium up on a video uh, system. System, especially one that keeps telling me you've written it wrong for YouTube. You've written all your descriptions wrong for YouTube when I've been writing podcast descriptions for 10 years. <laughs> I keep having to go in and correct all of our uh, podcast descriptions. Oh, no. It's not fun. It's not fun. <laughs> well, uh, computer, yeah, it's 
Skynet's at, uh, telling you what to do. Then. Absolutely. Yeah, yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Computer says no. Computer says no. We've decided that we're going to use YouTube for podcasts, but didn't make any changes to the YouTube <laughs> functionality for for, uh, for doing it. So uh, you've got to correct your way of doing things. But that's fine. At least it opens uh, YouTube up and YouTube music up uh, for other people that to listen true, to That is true, actually. Podcast. And we have been getting a lot of new bits of feedback on shows that we finished covering yep ages ago it is hilarious i've been getting i got some feedback in i'll tell chris this because john knows and our listeners don't know this but i was getting feedback in uh, on shows like penny dreadful that we did a podcast <laughs> on about four years ago going i love this show i'm so glad you're covering it i've listened to your other podcasts that's awesome i love yeah, that absolutely so really opening good. up the entire catalog of uh, of tv podcast industries to a brand new audience uh, yeah, and i think we had uh, something like 500 uh, listens to the shang chi um movie podcast in two days this week <laughs> uh, out of nowhere which we recorded again the weekend of release for shang chi three years ago so how many awesome. of those were bots well I, that's the good thing it tells you all the stats <laughs> of the actual listenership for the shows so i'm not talking about the actual impressions because there's about three thousand of those the old google bots of listeners. It's great. <laughs> thank you to all our new listeners Absolutely. Welcome to all of our listeners that we've found through YouTube. Really good to, to have you on board. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll speak to you again next time for the 14th episode of The Bad Batch, Flash Strike. Looking forward to what that's going to be. A Flash episode. in the pan. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a really good title. Better be good. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's going to be Flash Strike, so they're just going to break in and break out of town. Exactly. In one episode. That's it. That's it. And then, and the then they all the, live the final... happily ever exactly. after. Exactly. And the final episode is just like, yeah. la, 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 la. Drink like... in the cantina on Pabu. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Talk to you again next time. Thanks so much. Speak to you then. Yeah. Thank you so much, fellow Batches. Until next time. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and of course, keep being bad. Bye. Bye.